Well, well I'm going to go ahead and get started. So thank you again uh, for joining us today for this webinar conducted by the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, together with our partner Ford Foundation and our colleagues from the Natural Resource Governance Institute and Tax Justice Network Africa. It's a pleasure to have everyone here today. My name is Ali Reedhead and I lead our work on tax for the IGF. Uh, and before I get um, too far along, I'd like to give you some guidance on interpretation today. So Will, if I can ask you to turn to the next slide. Um, so we do, we're fortunate that we have interpretation today in French, uh, Spanish and uh, English. Uh, so if you go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the globe and choose the language that you would prefer to listen in. So there is uh, interpretation in English, French and Spanish. Thanks, Will. If I can ask you to move to the next slide. Um, before I take you through the agenda, I'd like just to set the scene on why we're here today. So the purpose of uh, this webinar and us getting together is to talk about the future of uh, mining taxation. So at IGF, we embarked on this journey a couple of years back now, together with our partner, the African Tax Administration Forum, to look at how governments can benefit financially from their mineral wealth. And this was prompted by a number of changes occurring in the mining sector, but also in society that our colleagues, uh, Will and Makupa, uh, will speak to shortly. But those changes that were taking place prompted us to ask the question, uh, how can or how should governments benefit financially from their mineral resources? And are there alternative ways of doing things that might offer better results for governments, for citizens, and also for industry? So this was a journey uh, that started uh, a couple of years back. And through that process, we had the opportunity to work with uh, lots of different collaborators, including um, Will from Tax Justice, uh, sorry, Will from NRGI and Makupa from Tax Justice Network Africa, along with some others that are joining us on the call today. People contributed ideas that we were then able to help them develop. And that culminated in a book that we were able to publish in June this year, The Future of Resource Taxation, and uh, launch that book in Lusaka, Zambia. And that goes into 10 policy ideas that we think um, offer interesting uh, options for countries as they look at how to uh, increase financial benefits from the sector. And my colleague Biola Taurus from IGF will take us through some of those ideas later on during the session. So that's why we're here and we're, we hope that's why the rest of you are here as well, to talk about, um, to take stock really of what's worked, what's not worked in terms of mining taxation and how could we do things differently going forward. In terms of the format for today, so um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, uh, Tony Bevington from Ford Foundation in a moment to share some opening reflections. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Will and Makupa on emerging trends as well as challenges to revenue collection. There'll be an opportunity for discussions with the audience, and then Viola will share some of the policy proposals outlined in the book, and then there'll be another opportunity for discussion. So we really encourage you to take this opportunity to share your experiences, your comments, ask any questions that you might have. Um, please feel free to write questions or comments in the Q&A function, in the comment function, and of course, also to raise your hand if you would like to speak at any point during the webinar, we'll do our best to get to you. So I think that is all I'm required to say. So I'll now pass over to uh, Tony, who's the International Program Director for Natural Resources and Climate Change at Ford Foundation. So thank you for being with us, Tony and Emmanuel, and um, over to you. Well, thanks, Ali. Um, my, as Ali says, my name is Tony Bevington. I direct the Natural Resources and Climate Change Program at Ford. Um, and my main job, in the next 40 minutes or so is to moderate the first two presentations and the, the Q&A. Before moving to introducing the two speakers, um, I guess just to re for reflection on why this theme is of relevance or of interest for us as Ford Foundation and as the Natural Resources and Climate Change Program. At, at its core, Ford is a social justice foundation or aspires to be a social justice foundation and in the work on natural resources the question of hmm. okay that looks like we might have just lost tony there briefly 
Um, hopefully he'll rejoin us. Oh, he's back. Sorry, I think we lost you there briefly, Tony. Um, I, I, do you get me happy now? Yes, all good. Sorry, such are the internet connections in Massachusetts. Apologies about that. So I was saying Ford's a social justice foundation and in the, or aspires to be, and in the natural resources and climate change work, we have had a line of work with partners on extractive industries in general as a social justice challenge. And one dimension of that social justice work that we've supported partners to, to address has been the whole fiscal question. And so I think for Ford, the relevance of the sort of discussions that we're going to have today are it resides in framing taxation as a justice question and framing the distribution of revenues from natural resources as a justice question. The second dimension of interest to Ford, and I think will be a theme today, is asking that same question within the context of broader discussions around just energy transition, which for us, as for many other organizations, has become an increasingly important theme in our way of trying to frame our work on natural resources. And there, I think the question for us is, within discussions on just energy transition, what are the points of entry for the justice-based points of entry for addressing taxation and fiscal questions? And then more specifically, to what degree, if any, is the tax and fiscal question different in the context of discussions around just energy transition? Or is it simply the same set of questions that have been grappled with over the past few years that raise their heads in the context of a different narrative, but at their core, they're the same set of challenges. And I think opinions differ in the field as to how far these fiscal questions are a rerun of the same challenges that have been addressed, addressed over the past few decades, or whether there's something fundamentally different in the context of energy transitions. So those are some of the reasons that bring forward to this theme and continue to sustain our program's interest and in the theme and recognition of its importance for our, for our work and that of our partners. So just 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 a little explanation of why why we're here uh, today. What I want to do now is pass over to our two speakers in this first section. Um, our first speaker is William Davis who is a senior economic analyst at the Natural Resources Governance Institute. And second speaker is Makupa Senduluka, who's a policy officer at the tax, uh, for tax and natural resource governance issues at TGNA, TGNA, the Tax Justice Network Africa. Uh, each will speak for 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll move to a Q&A period. For asking questions, there are two options. You can raise hands or you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen um, in, the, in the Zoom screen and enter your question there. So, and in the presentations, the emphasis of William's presentation will be primarily on emerging trends in the mineral sector and the impl implications that you have for revenues. And, and Makupa will highlight a number of challenges related to these trends and emerging, emerging issues. So with that, I want to pass over to you, William. So 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll pass from you to Makupa. Thank you very much, Tony. And it's a pleasure to be with you here, with you all here today to discuss this, uh, the set of very interesting and important issues. Um, so as Tony mentioned, I'm going to be discussing emerging trends for the mining sector, particularly I'm going to be focusing on the transition to renewable energy and um, opportunities that it creates for mining countries and also at some, um, some ideas about how to seize those opportunities. Later on in the program, um, I'll be coming back to talk about some of the challenges, but uh, that will be after, after our Q&A break. Um, 
just to note that uh, it, we, it's not that we think that um, the energy transition is the only emerging trend in the mining sector. Um, I think if you've read some of the other materials published by um, our partners, IGF and uh, and TGNA, um, uh, you'll see that there are there are other really important important trends that are going to um, have a big impact on the way the sector runs. Things like um, new technology coming into the sector, automation, and so on. And then um, uh, I think, as Makupa is going to touch on shortly, the the impact of the global movement um, for more just uh, fiscal regimes and um, discussions around um, how to how to have a, 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 a global approach um, to taxation that uh, that helps to address some of these some of these challenges. But me, I'm just going to focus on the on the energy transition in in my remarks. So, uh, in particular. Um, what what we're going to cover today, uh, if in my presentation, is um, how large the opportunity is for mining countries related to um, the minerals that are going to be in high demand during the energy transition, or transition minerals for short. Um, and second, we're going to look at how those countries can uh, can seize these these opportunities. Um, and then the key messages from uh, from my presentation are first that um, the demand for certain certain minerals that are required to produce the technologies needed to move to an energy system based on renewables um, is uh, an important, a sizable opportunity for a number of mining countries. Um, perhaps not for all, but um, uh, certainly for a good number. Um, and the second key message is that poor um, uh, is that in order to seize the uh, these opportunities, it's going to be necessary to adapt mining tax regimes um, to uh, to the trends and the realities of the energy transition. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about how countries might be able to do that. But before I go further, I'd like to first ask you a question. Why will the transition to renewable energy create opportunities for mineral producing countries? Um, and uh, please feel free to um, to post answers in the in the chat in the chat box. So I'm going to move on now to the next slide. Um, uh, hopefully you've had a moment to think about that question and um, maybe we'll see some answers coming into the chat box um, uh, shortly. Um, so for mining countries, there's a growing demand for minerals linked to the transition to, to renewable energy. Above all, copper, but also cobalt, lithium, um, uh, graphite, etc. And you can see from this graph um, a, for a forecast from the World Bank of how much uh, demand for some of these minerals is expected um, to grow by 2050 compared to the 2018 level of production. Um, if the world takes action needed to limit global warming to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, and so you can see that um, uh, for some of these minerals like graphite, lithium, cobalt, it's over a 450% increase. Um, you can see that the increase in demand for copper forecast is relatively small, um, but that may be because actually the demand for copper is already very high. Um, and uh, um, what we what we can see is that it's going to be, be maintained and um, to strengthen, uh, strengthen a little bit as um, uh, the progress in in electrification that we've seen over um, uh, over the last um, uh, few decades will continue over the next few. Um, this slide shows the opportunities that this may create for specific countries. Um, so the, the graphic shows uh, the level of um, transition mineral reserves, um, uh, that is the uh, reserves that have already been discovered and um, and uh, are already considered to be um, uh, economically viable to um, uh, to extract and produce. 
Um, obviously, this is an estimate based on the based on um, what S and P, which is the source of the data, think the long term price of these minerals is going to be. Um, but it just kind of gives you gives you an idea of um, uh, the size of the opportunity for certain countries. So you can see that, for example, for Chile, um, the value of uh, of its reserves linked to the energy transition um, is around two point two trillion dollars. Um, and similarly for Peru, uh, about around uh, one trillion US dollars. Um, and just to note that based on um, the historical rate at which reserves um, tend to be converted into uh, into government revenues, um, it's around uh, that that conversion rate is around um, uh, sixteen percent. Um, so, for so, what would that mean in terms of government revenues that these countries could expect? Well, for example, um, that that might mean around three hundred and seventy billion dollars uh, for Chile and one hundred and sixty billion um, in additional revenues for for Peru, for example. Um, and this uh, this graph shows us. Um, some of those numbers uh, for the the potential potential revenues on a per capita basis. Sometimes it's important to um, to put these things in context um, and uh, and look at how much resource wealth is worth in uh, on a per capita basis because otherwise. Um, the, there's a risk of um, inflated expectations and the public believing that resource discoveries are going to be sufficient to move a country um, uh, from um, a low income level to, to high income. Um, and uh, often that's, uh, that's not the case. Um, so as you can see, for some of the countries that highlighted on the last um, graph, um, the total value of these reserves for, for example, Indonesia is just uh, $300 per person. And that's obviously going to be spread over the next few decades um, when uh, these reserves are going to be extracted. Um, but for Chile and New Caledonia, Chile with um, $18,000 per person and New Caledonia with 90, 92,000, um, there's, uh, yeah, um, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat more important. So how can we seize the opportunities um, uh, re related to these minerals? Um, well, one of the one of the ways that we can do this is by making sure that the tax um, uh, tax system is appropriate um, to at the same time maximize revenues from getting uh, getting these minerals out of the ground. I talk about revenues rather than employment um, or, or industrial development opportunities, because based on our experience, government revenues are the main way in which mining company mining countries um, benefit from uh, from their mineral reserves. Um, unfortunately, industrial development opportunities seem to um, uh, uh, seem to be too difficult to um, uh, to realize in many cases. And um, uh, although although um, it, mining can be an important employer, um, uh, the uh, the transition to increased automation in the mining sector means that this is going to become a less and less of an important benefit. And also, typically, we see that the value of um, employment uh, um, of the the employment opportunities for people from from countries where mining takes place um, is much less than than the value of what the government can um, uh, can can get in revenues if the tax regime is, uh, is set up right. So how um, uh, so how can um, tax regimes be adapted to uh, to make sure that um, governments maximize their revenues, but at the same time also uh, continue to attract investment into the mining sector, which is um, uh, which is of course necessary in order to in order to um, uh, get any revenues at all. Uh, well, one um, uh, one of the key areas, and this is um, it's been a long-standing recommendation that we've made for extractive sector uh, tax regimes, but it's it may be even more important for some transition minerals, is to have flexible taxation. What do we mean by um, uh, by flexible taxation? We mean taxation that adjusts to um, to economic conditions, so that 
mining companies pay more in tax when their um, uh, when conditions are such that they can be more profitable um, and uh, pay less in tax when um, uh, when their profits are lower and where it might not be economically viable for them to continue pro continue production if um, uh, if the taxation burden was was too high. Um, Flexible taxation can be particularly important when the price of the of the mineral is um, uh, is highly unpredictable. This is because um, if you try to set uh, a, um, uh, a an inflexible tax regime um, and you you try to get the level of taxation right um, for a, a commodity that has a very um, unpredictable um, and, and volatile price. Um, you risk either having uh, the level of taxation uh, too high um, and de deterring investment because it's it's not possible for the for the mining companies to make any money, or setting it too low and um, uh, and missing out on those revenues, and um, and having a flexible tax um, tax regime helps the government to kind of hedge against those different scenarios and have something where they don't actually need to know what the level of uh, or to, they don't need to know with certainty what the level of the price is going to be over the over the long term and we think that this is going to be particularly important for transition minerals because um their prices often tend to be highly volatile here the slide shows you the um the price of cobalt over the last five years and you can see between 2018 and 2019 a price falls by more than half. And then by 2021, it's increased back to the level of the, the 2018 price. And then by 2023, it's fallen by more than half again. And this is just over the space of five years. Um, so these are, are these are, these are obviously very big swings in price. If you look at lithium, the level of volatility is even greater. Um, and uh, um, and compared to some uh, traditional minerals, for example, gold or copper, uh, cobalt and lithium have a much higher level of price volatility. Um, and uh, an example that shows how important this uh, kind of flexible tax regime is um, and um, why it's so difficult for the government to kind of um, set a particular um, set a particular level of taxation if if it's not flexible and they don't know what the price is going to be, comes from Zambia. Um, Zambia changed its tax regime for the mining sector ten times in sixteen years, and often uh, the government would um, reduce taxes at times when prices were low and uh, and they were fearful of not attracting enough investment, and then increase taxes at times when prices were high. But the problem was that because of the the time it takes to change the law and um, and reform the tax regime, more often than not, um, uh, they missed out on a significant amount of investment um, when prices were high and sorry when prices were low and uh, and taxes were high, but then also missed out on um, on a, on a significant amount of revenue when when the converse was true. And often, by the time they changed the tax regime, the uh, the price was just about to change. It was either about to um, to make to make the new tax regime that they just adopted less appropriate. Um, and we see that the Zambian government has um, has now adopted a, a regime that is um, that aims to be more flexible. Um, William, do you mind? Can we begin wrapping yeah. up uh, the pastor to Makupa? Sure. Um, so linked to this, investors say that tax regimes that are unpredictable are one of the main factors that invest that put them off investing in the mining sector. Um, and so I think this is my last slide before I pass over. Another challenge for producing countries to benefit from their transition minerals is the risk of tax avoidance by um, uh, by mining companies. And we think that this risk is particularly important for transition minerals um, because uh, the transition minerals tend to be part of highly integrated global supply chains. So it's very likely that they will be traded 
from a mining company that is part of a multinational group to another part of that group, um, which makes it easier to avoid taxes when you when you sell the minerals because you can set the 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 company um, uh, can set the price at which it's exporting to its business partner, um, and can set the price too low if it wants to avoid taxes in the in the exporting country. Um, in addition, for many transition minerals, there's uh, little transparency around the prices, um, the true prices for these minerals, in part because because of the very fact that it's dominated, the markets are dominated by multinational corporations. So the prices that you see may not reflect um, the true value of what's being exported. Um, and uh, for this reason, we think it's particularly important for tax authorities to have the um, technical, technological and human resources that they need to tackle um, uh, tax avoidance. And I think Viola is going to talk about some specific solutions uh, to, to deal with these problems later in her presentation. Um, and I think that since I'm out of time, I will pass over to Makupa now. Um, uh, thanks. Thank you very much. And looking forward to speaking to you later. Thank you, William, for setting that uh, amazing context on uh, the current state of play with the energy transition and mining. As has been mentioned, my name is Mokopa and I'm from the Tax Justice Network Africa, and I'll be giving more of a perspective on tax justice and what we've been doing around this work through the different um, elements uh, that we've uh, published, as well as the activities that we do. Next slide, please. And so, as William has mentioned already, and I think Tony also alluded to this, um, there are indeed new opportunities that exist for mineral rich countries, especially with uh, the transition and the opportunity to optimize revenue for domestic uh, resource mobilization. Um, and it then presents an opportunity as well to ensure that uh, as countries, particularly countries in the global south that are resource rich, uh, this presents an opportunity to be able to optimize collection from the sector. And uh, we'll be exploring some of those in this uh, section, but more importantly, looking at some of the challenges that hinder domestic revenue mobilization from the mining sector and uh, what are some of the ways we can, what some of the solutions are we can uh, to address the challenges. Next slide, please. So in thinking about the future of resource taxation, I think there is need to reflect on what uh, some of the elements that hinder optimal domestic resource revenue mobilization are. And we as a movement are really concerned about benefits to resource rich countries as well as mine host communities that host these mining projects. Oftentimes we see in our work that the people that host these projects are far removed from benefiting from, uh, from, from the mining activities. And so the question then becomes, how do we address existing inequalities? How do we address the challenges that hinder uh, revenue mobilization for development, uh, even as we go forward with the energy transition? In our most recent publication, titled The Principles of Tax Justice and Climate Crisis in Africa's Resource-Rich Nation, we explore how the principles of tax justice and what might mean for Africa's extractive sector, especially within the context of climate change and the energy transition. We are all agreed that indeed there's a need to rethink and relook the current tax systems, both internationally and nationally. And so these principles through these principles, we are reflecting through some of the elements that need to change going forward to address the challenges that exist. Next slide. So in this slide, um, I have about four of the five principles, pick the four that relate to this presentation, and I'll be helping us think through uh, what those R's are. We term them the five R's of tax justice, uh, and we use them to reflect on some of the changes and challenges that need to happen. So the first R really focuses on the raising revenue. And here we are seeking to ask the question, how can tax be used as a tool to raise revenue for development and climate financing amidst the existing challenges? And 
as has been already alluded to by William, we do face the challenge of corporate tax avoidance in the sector. And uh, there's a social cost to that corporate tax avoidance, which I'll touch on a little later. So going forward, the challenge remains, how do governments close those tax loopholes to ensure that this revenue is, is harnessed for development and climate financing in the context of limited resources in resource-rich countries? The other R looks at the redistribution of wealth. How can tax be used as a tool to redistribute wealth so that um, inequalities, existing inequalities uh, between citizens as well as different regions can be addressed? And here we speak to the issue of revenue sharing arrangements, that going forward, there'll be need for the collected tax to be redistributed to especially those uh, communities that are affected most by um, mining projects to be given a percentage of the revenue to compensate them uh, for the disruptions that come with mining, whether it's socially, culturally, uh, economically, and environmentally. The next R is really the principle around representation. And here we seek to address the challenge of citizen inclusivity in resource governance and decision making on revenue use. And the principle advocates that expanding the tax base from mining could help to build the trust between the state and citizens. And this would invariably ensure increased accountability and responsiveness in revenue use uh, from mining activities. Additionally, this principle also advocates that adequate representation of vulnerable groups like women uh, are also included, um, to be also included in decision-making processes. All this is to build the trust between state and citizens, because oftentimes when trust is missing, we see that um, tax uh, is then uh, not adequately used because uh, citizens feel their, the money that they're paying through taxes is not being used adequately. Uh, and so how do we then ensure that the, the, the trust between citizens and the state is enhanced through the revenues coming from uh, taxes paid uh, through the sector? The last one is really from a justice point of view reparations to ensure that compensation for historical legacy of colonization and eco ecological damage is, 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 is realized. And with this, it's really thinking through some of the historical legacies that have been brought about by the industrialization processes of the global North countries. And now that we in the global South are facing the negative impacts of some of those industrialization processes. And here we are asking the question, can tax be used as a tool to sort of compensate for some of those um, um, negative impacts that have come about due to uh, historical ecological damages and uh, colonization itself. And here we propose that tax can be used as a tool levied on multinationals headquartered in the global north, be paid to countries in the global south and be used uh, for um, climate adaptation and mitigation uh, so that the, the communities, for example, that host these mining projects can have environmental protection mechanisms to ensure that they are not negatively impacted by continued uh, mining activities. So those are the four R's, but I will reflect more on the raising revenue uh, for development and climate financing. Next slide. So as has been mentioned, I think the challenges are there and we've acknowledged that we are not collecting the adequate revenue that is required for our development. And why is this the case? The current international tax system has undermined domestic revenue mobilization efforts in mineral rich countries and profit shifting and corporate tax abuse continue to be a challenge um, and will continue to be a challenge as demand for uh, transition minerals heighten. There will be greater revenue risks for mineral resource countries if the international, if the current international tax system is maintained. And that's why as a tax justice movement, if you've been following the conversation around reforming the international financial system or the international tax architecture, our advocacy work has really been pushing to ensure that reform happens because we believe that if reform in the international tax system does not happen, the future of mining taxation, especially in resource rich countries in the global south, uh, will not work to benefit citizens. And therefore, one of the things we are advocating is that uh, because it's a current challenge that's exacerbating profit shifting and corporate tax abuse, 
can we reform the current international tax system to ensure that it starts to benefit citizens um, through revenue collection? Next slide, please. Here, we are looking basically at the social economic cost of profit shifting. Now, this is something that we are very, very uh, interested in because corporate tax abuse has a social economic cost to it. Um, and it undermines the ability for governments to provide the fundamental economic social rights that enable citizens to live fulfilled lives. And so when you look at some of the numbers coming from the IMF and the UN, it's quite alarming. In a recent report in 2021, the International Monetary Fund report notes that corporate tax avoidance from mining uh, costs the sub-Saharan Africa region about 730 million United States dollars annually. And this really is a modest estimate. And so our question in the movement is, how do we close that revenue loophole to ensure that this 730 million is retained on the continent for development? Next slide, please. The next figure is from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development that notes that illicit financial flows linked to the export of primary extractive resources in Africa are estimated to be as high as 40 billion per year. Now, this 40 billion United States dollars is almost half of the 89 billion that the continent loses annually. And so you can see that the extractive industry is a huge contributor to the problem of illicit financial flows. This again is revenue we believe that could be channeled to public services and development if it's well captured and collected. Next slide. Now we go into looking at the case of Zambia and I'm glad that William highlighted some statistics from Zambia and some of the challenges around policy inconsistencies that we faced as a country. In 2021, Oxfam did a study that showcased the potential tax avoidance that could be happening due to the operations of Glencoe in the country. Glencoe has since left the country and is no longer operating there, but they were managing and working through a subsidiary uh, project called the Mopani Copper Mines. And in this report, Oxfam estimates that the Glencoe Group generated nearly six, six billion United States dollars in total revenue via this subsidiary called Mopani Copper Mines but paid only 28 million United States dollars in corporate income tax over the eight year period of 2011 to 2018. Now that is very alarming. And the report further highlights that had Glencoe not shifted profits artificially, Zambia should have been receiving at least 91 million annually in taxes from the Mopani project. And this amount could have gone into meeting almost half of the national water supply and sanitation budget um, needs. So we see that there's a direct impact on service delivery as a result of corporate tax avoidance in Zambia's mining sector. And going forward, we as the tax justice movement are saying the future of resource taxation has to look different because monies that need to finance development need to be harnessed back into the economy. Next slide, please. Now, in just reflecting more broadly, as I conclude on some of the other challenges that have hindered raising revenue for, uh, for development in resource-rich countries like Zambia and others, we've spoken about corporate tax abuse, which is already a given, has been, as has been highlight, highlighted in previous slide, slides. The next is the awarding of overly generous tax incentives that do not result in additional investment. And I think in our work, this is something that we've been pushing. And also the work that IGF and others have done to demonstrate that awarding tax incentives, particularly the overly generous tax incentives, do not result in additional FDI as has been uh, pro, uh, often put forward. And so in our work, we advance for the need for governments to conduct cost benefit analysis on these tax incentives before awarding them, and the continuous need to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of these tax incentives. Because research has shown that actually ta awarding tax incentives like tax holidays to the mining sector is actually redundant and does not result in value addition to uh, the production figures or the economy as a whole. So going forward, we are saying there is need for um, governments to uh, do cost-benefit analysis and evaluate these in tax, tax incentives for them to be effective. 
Also, the challenge of ongoing double taxation treaties that limit the taxing rights of resource-rich countries. You'll find that in most countries, these are treaties that were signed in pre-colonial or colonial times and so have really outdated terms. So going forward, there is need to review some of the terms that are in these treaties as they undermine revenue collection in resource-rich countries. Next slide, please. Mukupa, could we begin wrapping up? So we have time for all those three questions that have been posed. So we have time for the questions, please. Sure, this is my last slide. So the lack of contract transparency, again, is another big issue. Um, and when you look at contract transparency, it's sort of the contracts are the beginning point of where the mining agreements are signed between companies and governments. And so we are pushing for the for the need to make these contracts public so that citizens can interrogate and ask the critical questions, especially on fiscal terms. And here we work a lot with members of parliament um, through the different caucuses that we've created across the continent to ensure that there's proper preparedness, even as they sit on those mining committees to sign these deals. The over-reliance of profit-based taxes, which has already been alluded to, is another factor that exacerbates the problem of illicit financial flows and corporate tax abuse. The lack of mineral value addition. I think the very fact that we are exporting our minerals in their raw form is problematic and undermines our ability to collect more from the sector. And there is therefore need to embrace documents that have been endorsed by the African Union, like the Africa Mining Vision, to ensure that our minerals actually um, have value added to them. Next is really what has already been spoken to by Will on governance challenges and policy inconsistencies and the need to ensure that uh, we address those. Lastly, on my last, last slide, Will, if you can take it, this is, I'll start where I began. I think there's much needed reform going forward. We believe that the future of mining taxation will be greatly impacted by how reforms in the international tax system pan out and evolve. And as a movement, we believe that addressing the inclusivity of development countries in global tax governance will be a first step to ensure that mineral-rich developing countries optimize tax revenue collection for their benefit. And so it's important that even as we have this discussion, reform of the systemic issue of the international financial system is actually at the center so that we can deal with the problem structurally. I'll end here and hand over to Viola. Thank you. Actually, before passing to Viola, we'll move to just a oh, few. Yes. Yeah, we have a few. We're running a bit late, but we have time for to take the questions in the Q and A. Thank you to those who've submitted those. What I want to do, I think, for ease, is read out those questions and then ask the two of you to take the questions that you feel most comfortable responding to. But if possible, make sure that among the two of you, you've managed to cover all five of them. I think there's five now. Yeah. So the the first is from from Eric from Cameroon is asking whether it's possible for African countries that have uh, energy transition minerals to influence the price of these minerals and to influence their general trajectory, um, and if so, how? And if not, why not? Then there's a question from Lushanya who asks, to what extent has the feasibility of implementing flexible taxes been explored? I think that's particularly for you, Will. Um, the, then from a third question from Mamadi is asking whether it's whether there's a case to be made for making uniform um, tax rates across Africa for uh, transition minerals. Um, as a way of avoiding some of the problems that some of you have been raising. Um, now the, uh, there's a there's a, another question, oh, actually I can, I'm gonna go, because Eric has two questions here. We'll have, hold a second question for the second round in case we just run out of time. There's a question from uh, Eddie saying, regarding the governance challenges and the policy inconsistencies, do you think that strategic planning, including strategic environmental and social assessment, would be of any help? Uh, and who should initiate that planning and assessment if it is of help? And finally, from Jonathan, how feasible is it to um, pursue resource value based tax, a resource value based tax system as against a profit based tax system? Um, 
and and here he's talking about fixing a tax rate so it's based on the value of resources mined rather than the profits declared so those are the questions that i'd ask you to speak to relatively quickly so that we just have if you could just take take just three or four minutes with those questions and then we'll pass over to the next presentations um should we start with you will um thanks very much tony yeah um uh so i'll just dive right in on the first question about how african countries that possess transition minerals um uh, can influence their prices uh, so I think that this this can be challenging. Um, in particular, um, in theory, if a, if a country by itself possesses enough of um, the global supply of a particular commodity, um, then uh, it can it can use that market power um, to try to influence uh, to try to influence the price. For example, by setting up a a national marketing board. Um, and in fact, the um, the DRC has established uh, such a such a process for its cobalt um, that is coming from artisanal mining. Um, it's uh, it's supposed to be sold through a, um, through a subsidiary of the National Mining Company, which is called uh, Entreprise Générale du Cobalt. Um, uh, yeah, that's the name of the subsidiary. Um, uh, but at, at the same time. As I understand it, the head of the the um, Congolese uh, National Mining Company has said that actually, even the DRC, which um, uh, accounts for most of the the world's cobalt production at the moment, um, has has missed the boat um, to kind of use its market power um, by by itself um, because the high price of cobalt has attracted um, exploration and dis uh, leading to discoveries in other countries, and now. Indonesia has entered the market with a significant amount of supply. Um, uh, then there's a question about could countries create a cartel, something like an OPEC for, for transition minerals. In fact, in the, in the 1970s, we had all kinds of commodity cartels, um, but they didn't, uh, they didn't last very long. And OPEC is really the last one standing. And the reason for this is that it was very difficult to enforce discipline on um, on different uh, the different countries that were members of those cartels, particularly when um, times were tough and um, uh, and they needed to increase their output of a particular uh, mineral, they needed to sell more, and they couldn't um, they couldn't act to kind of keep this restrict the supply um, and keep prices high. Um, what distinguished over OPEC from the other commodity cartels is um, its flexibility um, and the fact that um, uh, there was, um, I guess, they agree, they agree um, uh, production quotas on a, on a rolling basis. Um, but and so if they can't agree, then there, then there's no then there's no restriction. Um, and I guess that that meant that instead of um, uh, there, there being fixed agreements and then people not respecting those countries not respecting those, and then um, members of the cartel saying, "Well, you know, there's no point." Um, by reviewing that every time they want to, or rather on a on a regular basis, um, it means that they're less likely to conclude that. Um, on the question of the feasibility of flexible tax regimes, um, so I think that. Uh, um, Many countries do uh, what what a mining tax regimes tend to do these days is to balance flexibility with uh, predictability and um, uh, uh, it, predictability for investors, but also um, reliability um, in terms of uh, having a reliable level of tax revenues and also some some tax instruments that are more uh, robust um, and protect against. Um, uh, protect against tax avoidance um, uh, because they are they're easier to um, uh, to assess. Um, one uh, one interesting tax instrument that we think could um, could be a good way to combine both flexibility and predictability is um, variable rate royalties. And I think Viola is going to talk about that in her presentation later. Um, finally, um, the question. Just sorry, one, yeah. just one minute, and then we'll move to Mukuba. Sorry. Okay, that's great. Yeah. 
The question on uh, whether it would be a good idea to have uniform uh, taxes for um, transition minerals across Africa. Um, so I think that the geology of uh, of different countries um, mean it can make it difficult to have uniform tax rates in the in the mining sector, um, and not just the geology, but other drivers of uh, of mining cost. Um, uh, in in the um, in the mining sector, I guess countries want to set their tax um, the tax burden as high as they possibly can while still attracting investment. But this may be different from one country to another, because if one country has higher costs um, for, for mining companies um, than, than another, um, and not all of the taxes are, are profit based, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you want to have some that uh, maybe not profit based, more, give more reliable revenues, um, then um, uh, then the country with the higher costs um, wouldn't be able to go as high and still attract investment. Um, and so that's why it might be difficult to have a uniform tax rate for, for transition minerals uh, across the continent. Thanks very much. Thanks, William. Mukupa, any thoughts? I'll be quick. I'll, I'll respond, since William has covered all the rest, I'll respond, I think, particularly to the, to the one from Eddie regarding governance challenges and policy inconsistencies and uh, strategic planning. So absolutely, Eddie, I think there is need for governments to have clarity, first of all, on the objective and vision they have for the mining sector, right? And once that is clear, they can then be able to um, be design a fiscal regime that meets the ambition of those aspirations. I think oftentimes we find that there's usually a rush for governments to quickly start exploiting uh, before they can determine exactly what their ambition is as a country in terms of what they want to get from the sector. So that's the first starting point in, in terms of strategic planning um, and, and uh, assessments. The second point is when it comes particularly to strategic planning on environmental and social assessments, I think governments should initiate, I think your question asks who should initiate the process. Governments should be the ones to initiate this process. And this, this, these assessments should be embedded in policy and laws to ensure that they are mandatory. Um, so that then you also have the right institutions that are mandated to conduct environmental and social impact assessments before a mining project starts. Um, again, usually due to the fact that there's usually a rush, the assessments are done in a hurry and uh, they never go back to look at them. And so you find that as the mining project has taken off, uh, impacts have been uh, um, felt by communities in a very negative way. So I think the best way is to ensure that this is in the policy and laws and that there's an institution that will actually enforce uh, the, the, the uh, environmental and social impact assessment. And I think this will be especially crucial with the energy transition and the dynamics now around extraction and climate change. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Makupa. I would just say that there's, there's a great set of questions in the Q&A. So if either of you uh, have time uh, to type an answer to any of those questions, that would also be great. At this point, I'll pass over to my colleague, Emmanuel, who will facilitate the second half of the webinar. Emmanuel. Very much. Uh, morning and uh... So we we move on to the second part of the of the presentations, um, and uh, William will highlight some solutions related to to, to governance issues that have been raised. Um, we will also have uh, Viola Taras, who's the policy advisor, and IGF will present some fiscal policy options uh, from the recently launched The Future of Resource Taxation. Uh, the document does have 10 policy ideas uh, to mobilize mining revenues and uh, kind of structured uh, as a handbook for policymakers that present uh, a menu of innovative fiscal measures to strengthen resource uh, collection in the mining sector. Um, so let's start with William. And you both have uh, about three and four minutes to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And um, 
So during this segment, as Emmanuel mentioned, we're going to see why it's important to reform mining governance and why it's urgent to do so. And also we're going to look at some of the key ways in which countries can make these changes. The key messages for this segment are as follows. The first is that poor mining governance is hindering countries' efforts to make the most of their mineral resources. And second is that it's urgent to address this, especially so that countries can benefit from the boom in demand for certain minerals linked to the energy transition. In order to benefit from their mineral reserves, improving transition minerals, um, improving uh, mining governance is urgent for, um, for uh, countries that produce transition minerals. Um, this is because uh, the um, uh, the demand for these minerals presents, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation, presents a, a, an important opportunity. Um, but uh, the current challenges um, limit the ability of countries to um, uh, to fully exploit it and attract the attract the investment that they need um, to to produce these minerals. Um, and levy the tax rates that they would that, that they would need to maximize the benefits. Um, in addition, uh, there will only be high demand for these minerals um, for a limited amount of time. Um, this is because countries representing two thirds of the global economy have adopted targets of reducing their emissions um, to put to uh, net zero by 2050. And that means that uh, a large a large part of the the transition of the energy system from fossil fuel based to renewable energy based should be undertaken by that date. Um, while after 2050, uh, there will continue to be demand for these for these minerals, it may not be at the same level um, because it will be about um, demand in line with the level of economic growth or maintenance and uh, replacement of um, uh, renewable energy technologies that need to be that um, uh, that have broken down or become obsolete. But between now and um, and 2050, we expect um, much more demand as countries seek to replace their fossil fuel based energy infrastructure with um, uh, with renewables based infrastructure. In addition, um, the uh, the average mine takes um, seventeen years for, um, to go from to go from discovery to production. Um, so, really, if countries want to um, uh, um, to be able to sell um, uh, to be able to sell um, uh, transition minerals during the peak period of the energy transition if we believe that it can be mostly accomplished by 2050 um then they uh they then they need to um uh make sure that they get their governance frameworks right not in 27 years but in the next 10 years so that they can um so, so that they can um uh, benefit from these frameworks when attracting investment um in uh, in new mines um moreover um uh Energy technologies are constantly evolving, um, and uh, where there are governance challenges um, it for for around the extraction of a particular mineral, um, researchers are looking into ways to reduce the use of that mineral in in renewable energy technologies, which um, uh, which may which poses the risk for the countries that are hoping to benefit from selling that mineral that. Um, uh, Actually, the world won't need it anymore because new technologies will come online um, that avoid the governance and uh, reputational risks for companies um, uh, of using that mineral. A case in point is uh, I'm going to uh, mention cobalt again, um, uh, where um, a combination of uh, of high tax rates in DRC, the main producer, and um, concerns about working conditions in uh, in artisanal mines in that country, um, as well as concerns about uh, mining broader mining governance, um, have led um, 
uh, companies such as Tesla, one of the world's biggest electric vehicle manufacturers, um, to say that they want to reduce the level of cobalt that they use in uh, in the batteries that go into their cars, and actually led researchers to intensify their efforts to develop new batteries that use less cobalt. Um, they particularly, uh, and, and they've actually been successful in, um, uh, in doing this. Um, so this kind of shows shows the urgency for for mining countries that have transition mineral reserves. If they want to benefit from the energy transition, um, they have to address these governance challenges as soon as possible. What areas of governance do you think need to be improved? Um, uh, please take a moment to post your your answers in the chat. I'll carry on and um, let you uh, continue to to post in the chat um, uh, as you as you reflect on this. Um, so, in our opinion, the key some of the key areas uh, um, that where mining governance need to be improved are um, in uh, avoiding corruption, in uh, managing and compensating impacts on uh, local communities located around mining areas. Um, in terms of the management of um, uh, of extractive revenues, and and also strong industrial policies um, to make the most of potential linkages from uh, from the mining sector to broader areas of industrial development. Um, I think that it, though I've talked about the urgency of uh, of mining governance reform already, um, I also wanted to just um, talk a little bit more about why it's not only urgent for the energy transition, but um, uh, but important even for um, minerals such as or metals such as gold, which are not really not really linked to the uh, to the energy transition, um, and uh, this is because. Uh, although it's it's also as as we know important in and of itself to uh, to avoid corruption to make sure that local communities around the mining site benefit and are not in fact harmed by by the presence of of mining companies and so on. Um, it's also important. These things are also important in order to attract investment and thus generate revenues from the mining sector. Um, and you can see from this graphic, um, which shows the correlation between the level of mining governance as measured by our resource governance index on the on the x axis um, and uh, the policy potential index, which measures the attractiveness to investors um, of a particular uh, mining um, uh, uh, mining country. And you can see kind of strong correlation between the two. And there's also other evidence, for example, from the oil sector, which is similar, that uh, um, countries with higher governance scores tend to attract um, more investment in, in exploration. Um, in a, and it makes sense that investors would prefer um, uh, to invest in countries where there's, um, uh, where there's better governance across these dimensions. Aside from the, the um, avoiding reputational risks of investing in countries um, with a reputation for, for, poor, for poor governance, there's also the fact that um, uh, um, poor governance leads to disputes and conflicts which disrupt production and um, uh, create costs for investors. For example, conflicts with local communities disputes with tax authorities over unclear tax regimes, um, uh, and also where, um, uh, where there isn't a clampdown on, on corruption, um, uh, of course, um, where an investor is able to come in um, uh, potential, possibly um, uh, in a corrupt way, and that's discovered later, um, then, the, then the, whole, um, the whole mining license will need to be retendered. And we see this, for example, with the Simandu iron ore deposit in Guinea, which is um, uh, the, the largest um, single iron ore deposit um, uh, in the world, as, as I understand it, that has um, been frozen from the 1990s until now because of um, corruption disputes around how that, um, uh, how that license was awarded. Um, this graph shows... Um, 
uh, ratings in terms of overall mining governance for an, an RGI's last resource net resource governance index uh, from 2021. Um, as you can see, some countries have uh, a high level of mining governance, Colombia, Peru, and Senegal, um, but others may still have um, uh, uh, may still have areas in which they can improve. Um, and in addition to improving overall mining governance, there are some specific areas that we're going to see in the uh, in the next few slides. Um, so, um, uh, um, and moving on now to um, uh, to to one of those um, is uh, is impro is improving um, the licensing and exploration process, um, or rather. Um, attracting more exploration by uh, by reconsidering um, countries' geological wealth. Um, and this is particularly important in the energy transition because remember the slide that I showed you um, earlier on in the session about the um, rapidly, the, the large increases in demand that we expect to see for transition minerals. Because, because there's such a large increase, it may be that some areas of the country that were explored in the past and considered not to have anything that was uh, commercially viable to mine could now become commercially viable. And so there could be a benefit um, of uh, re-exploring um, uh, some geographical areas where exploration has already taken place and dusting off the results of old geological surveys to see if they indicate that some of these, um, uh, some of these minerals could be present. Uh, another, um, uh, another way to do this is to, is to um, another way to attract more exploration um, is to share geological data with companies to encourage them to um, uh, um, to to look further, um, and uh, also to share geological data with their neighbours, um, because deposits in a country on one side of the border, discoveries in a country on one side of the border mean that it's more likely um, for uh, the same mineral to be discovered on, on the other side of the border. Um, because of uh, because of these um, uh, these opportunities, um, governments should get ready to potentially grant licenses to um, revive previously unviable projects, or to see a, a large increase um, in interest in um, uh, in mining in their countries. Um, and um, uh, as a result, they need to make sure that their licensing process is well governed, um, transparent, and has strong anti-corruption protections. And we, this is particularly important because we know that from previous commodity booms, um, actually often the opposite happens. Um, countries are keen to make deals quickly, um, they cut corners, and uh, risks of corruption arise. Um, so I, I think it, what what we would like to argue is that um, uh, it's an it's really important to ensure that um, uh, gold standard controls are in place so that the country benefits from uh, from new mining licenses um, rather than following a kind of quick and dirty approach um, which risks um, only. Um, uh, only a corrupt deal makers um, benefiting from from new licenses being being granted. Um, uh, just coming back to geological data, um, uh, um, just to reinforce the point on on how important it is to to make sure that that's good quality. Um, historically, it's been it's been seen that um, uh, poor quality geolo geological data is one of the main reasons why Africa tends to be underexplored for um, uh, for mineral wealth. So now coming to the conclusion of this segment, I'm just going to recap the key messages um, as you can see on my slide. Uh, so. Um, uh, Poor mining governance may stop countries from seizing um, their opportunities linked to mining, and it's urgent for countries to address these issues, especially those that have um, significant um, wealth in transition minerals. Thank you very much. And now I pass on to Viola. Thank you so much, Will, 
for taking us through the governance solutions. I will spend a um, couple more few minutes to take you through some of the fiscal policy solutions. Um, so these solutions um, are derived from the future resource taxation handbook that we recently launched in Lusaka, Zambia. There are 10 policy solutions that were crowdsourced from government and non-government stakeholders. And then what we did is researched on these solutions, their viability, and we made recommendations in the handbook. So I'd encourage you to look at the handbook to look at all the 10 policy solutions. For the purpose of this session, I'm going to take you through a few of the policy solutions. And it's really interesting to see that already a couple of people have highlighted these solutions. So my work will be very easy and we so that we can get to take on a couple of more Q&As which are flowing in. Next slide, Will. One thing that I want to mention is as we were doing, as we were conducting this crowdsourcing of um, ideas uh, from both government and non-government stakeholders, it was very clear that governments, um, for governments to benefit from um, resource, um, from the energy transition, from the rising in demand of critical minerals, governments are really keen to have simple regimes. They are very keen to get, um, to have a fair mining fiscal regime, but also a regime that is equitable, um, sharing, allocating benefits equally um, fairly for, between the investor and the mining and the, the mining company and also the government, but also importantly taking consideration of the communities that are living close to the sector, to the mining, where mining is taking place. So it's really important to understand what really governments are looking out for. And so these solutions are geared to try and um, respond to this, um, to, to respond to what governments are looking for in a mining regime. So the first one is um, one of the policy option we look at in the handbook is the sixth method. Uh, so this is a policy option that has its origin in the Latin American countries. And as you've heard from Will and Mukupa, one of the key challenges that governments are facing is on determining the price of these minerals. And so the sixth method helps to limit the risk of underpricing of minerals, especially where we have related party trans transactions. So the six method uses publicly quoted prices to calculate the revenue from the sale of minerals um, as in a way of to calculate in, for the purpose of calculating corporate income tax. So the use of simple and um, transparent mechanisms or prices that are available and seen publicly um, avoids then, for example, invest um, or related where these are related party transactions from under quoting the price of a mineral, meaning then the company, the uh, government will get more out of um, its mineral reserves. So we've highlighted in the handbook a couple of countries that are using it, Zambia being one of them. And look, uh, we look into the detail about the uh, key advantages and disadvantages of that. Next slide. Another policy option that we look at is a production sharing contract. In the comments, I've seen exam um, someone asking then, is it possible to move uh, the allocation, uh, to move the extraction of minerals to governments so that governments can do it so that we can avoid um, this issue of profit shifting. So one of the things we look at in the handbook is how can government participate more in the extraction of these resources? We look at, for example, the state-owned, the role of state-owned enterprise, something that we can see that it's um, increasing becoming important in the mining sector is production sharing contracts. So governments want to move away from using a corporate income tax as a way of collecting revenues from the mining sector because again of the um, what Mukupa has, has highlighted as the challenges with corporate income tax and now they want to move to a resource-based um, taxation or what we call production sharing contract. Governments want to get more of their mining revenues in form of production and which has clear advantages for, for example, from apart from using um, advantages from using the corporate income tax. Some of the advantages and what government will be avoiding here when they get more of their revenues in terms of production is that the risk of um, uh, the risk of underpricing of minerals for the purposes of calculating corporate income tax is avoided when you're using production sharing contracts. So those are some of the key advantages. And with production, government can be able to receive production, um, its share of revenue as soon as production starts. So the allocation starts from when as soon as uh, production starts, as opposed to corporate income tax, 
which happens only when the mining company has made a profit. So we highlight in the book, what are some of the pros and cons of using production sharing contract. We can see that countries, for example, Uganda, Senegal, Papua New Guinea are now introducing within the mining legislations, the use of production sharing contract and moving away from corporate income tax. Next slide. Something that's also very important and also relates to the governance of the mining sector is the use of competitive bidding to allocate mining resource. And here we want to start from the start that who is the investor that um, is getting the rights to re extract the resources from the ground. So it's really important. Uh, most mining jurisdictions use what we call a fast come fast basis. So whoever knocks on the, on the Ministry of Mining door fast is the one who's going to extract the resource but here we are um, the one of the policy options we look at is the use of competitive bidding where we have um, several mining companies competing or bidding to get the right to acquire the resource so here you get the best most technically and financially investor to um, to extract the resource meaning there's going to be more revenues out of the ground and also in terms of allocation that governments can be able to get more we talk more about this and also share examples of countries that have um, this um, kind of um, policy option in use. Next slide. Lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about compensation and why this is, really, um, um, before compensation, I'll talk about variable royalties, but Will has alluded to this, so I'll skip this. But we really think it's important in, when countries are, keep changing their regime um, or royalty rates, subject to increased demand um, for their um, minerals. One of the things we look at in the handbook is the use of variable royalties, which are self-adjusting. And so countries do not have to keep on changing their royalty regimes. And so it is self, it will self-adjust based on the profitability of a mine or the price of a commodity. And so again, this ensures that government are getting more revenues when the demand is high. Lastly, I'm going to look at one of the policy options that touches on the compensation. And this was a policy option that was written by Will Davis here, and he can elaborate further for anyone who's interested on in carbon pricing and mineral export. As most of you know that the European Union has um, has um, in place the, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, uh, which has an impact, ex for example, on the um, resource-rich developing countries that are exporting to the EU and do not have a carbon tax within their jurisdictions. So then what, what means that it's going to shift uh, more revenues to the EU as opposed to what remains behind. And so we'll explore the use, um, the applicability of carbon pricing mechanisms within African jurisdictions or developing resource-rich countries that are exporting to the EU as a way of retaining more um, revenues within the country. Countries. And we explain more, uh, citing, for example, one country that has a carbon price, a carbon tax is a South Africa, but also we explain some of the problems that they've had in terms of um, uh, enforcing a carbon tax. So those are some of the policy options and um, feel free to reach uh, to go to the handbook where we explore more. One of the policy options we look at, for example, is on development tax, which ensures that once um, that revenues directly trickle down to communities as opposed to going direct uh, fast to the national government and asking the national government to then distribute to the communities. So here we enforce, a, uh, we recommend countries could look at, for example, a development and over tax or earmarking some of the fiscal tools that they have to ensure that they directly move to the communities. I'll stop here because of time, uh, but one of the things that we mentioned also in the handbook is we were very clear advising governments on, for example, what does it mean to enforce some of these policy options that they have to look at, for example, what law needs to change. They have to consider the interactions between the different legal instruments, but also most importantly, it's important um, to enforce these policy options in accordance to general principles of good governance, meaning that governments um, need to do a consultative process with civil society, with mining investors to ensure that everyone gets to have um, a fair share or an equitable share from the mining sector. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, William and uh, Viola, for <clears throat> taking us through some of these um, governance and um, uh, uh, other policy options that are available. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I guess it'd be useful to just take um, one or two questions. 
I can see that the chat section is very much alive, um, which is very good. So, um, so, so, Viola, first, you know, some some of these policy options that you uh, mention uh, kind of uh, present incremental changes, but some will require very fundamental structural changes to the fiscal regimes themselves. You know, given the uh, political economy and landscape that most of these countries are faced with, how realistic are some of these uh, proposals? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Yes, it's true that some of the policy options we look at in the handbook are very small incremental changes, but have a huge bearing on how much revenues get to be collected. But some, for example, like the use of production sharing contracts presents an, a complete overhaul of the mining fiscal regime. As most of you know that the mining sector rely on royalties and corporate income tax. And so a move to a production sharing contract would be a complete um, change. And so with some of the countries that are already looking to implement production sharing contracts, one message, one key um, message that they tell us is, for example, they've received a lot of pushback from, for example, the private um, investors from the mining company saying this is not how mining is currently undertaken. And so governments would become a bit more jittery in terms of not um, um, not um, creating an imbalance within the status quo. So we see that is going to happen. But most importantly, uh, one of the things that, that that was very important to us when we were writing this handbook is to share examples of countries that are already implementing some of these policy tools and showing that it is working. And so we one of the key messages to governments is not to be stuck in this um, already system that is not working, that there are options, that there are countries that are already pursuing these options and it is working for them. And so it's really important to look to these examples, but also most importantly, again, to um, have, for example, an economic analysis of why um, this would mean more revenues for the, um, for the governments. And it is indeed like revenues that they should be entitled to. So that's one thing that we made sure to have in the handbook. What are the examples of countries that are pursuing these um, regimes? Is it working for them? And giving a couple of more context. Thanks. Thank you, Viola. And maybe the last question to William. So um, this is coming from Caleb Boigne. Um, and it's about um, best practices for minimizing corruption. And maybe you want to take this together with a question around, uh, given that NRGI has been working quite a lot with civil society organizations, what do you think um, would be the role of civil society in bringing about this change? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, so I think that um, as with many different policies, civil society needs to hold government to account um, to uh, uh, to make sure that a government is um, is implementing the kinds of policy frameworks that are um, that are needed to um, to tackle corruption. Unfortunately, we've seen an erosion of the civic space in which civil society operates in many countries, um, making it difficult for civil society to to do its work without um, uh, without being harassed um, or intimidated by by government or worse. Um, but uh, um, I think. Uh, uh, some other things I can say about how to tackle corruption in um, uh, in the mining sector, particularly in licensing, um, I think it's um, uh, it's well known that um, the use of um, uh, commissioned agents is a real risk point um, for corruption in in mining. Um, you know, uh, it, it kind of gives gives uh, mining companies deniability um, if they pay somebody to kind of secure a, a mining contract for them, and they pay them very handsomely, um, and then they they think that you know they say that they were just paying them for their expertise, but really they know that um, the person is going to use that payment to to pay a bribe into a, in, in in order to secure the contract. Um, uh, it, aside from this, there are a number of other areas um, that are of high risk of, of corruption in mining, and we think that governments should um, should focus on those on those um, uh, high risk areas. 
Um, some of these, uh, some of the key points are laid out in our report that we published um, uh, last year called uh, called Triple Win. Um, and uh, this year we've uh, we've published um, a, a French version of that report as well. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we've come to the, there are quite a number of questions uh, still in the chat and very interesting uh, opinions also raised in the chat as well. Uh, but uh, we've come to the end of, of this. And um, first of all, I would like on behalf of uh, IGF and uh, Natural Resource Governance Institute and uh, Tax Justice Network Africa, uh, to thank you very much for spending this afternoon um, in this conversation. I know that it was also quite a, an early morning for some of you and also an afternoon and quite a late afternoon for, for others. We want to thank you for this. Um, I will not uh, attempt a, a summary, uh, but I think the key uh, issues uh, for me that um, you know, mining sector presents a large uh, revenue potential for, for finance and development. But what is clear from this conversation is that this potential is often undermined by several challenges. Um, and, and also that, you know, with the spike in demand for transition minerals, you know, some countries are already updating their, their uh, uh, fiscal frameworks. And the expectation is that many more countries will do so. Uh, but we know that Beyond just tweaking, uh, you know, existing fiscal frameworks, countries will will need to uh, uh, undertake new uh, policy frameworks and investment models uh, that are more robust uh, to deal with the issues uh, such as tax avoiding, etc., from the onset. Uh, but we know that the need for these new fiscal regimes, you know, will, will, will require a lot of support around rebuilding uh, public, finance, uh, public finances, especially for uh, countries uh, in the South, uh, you know, as part of the post-COVID build-up and also addressing some of the debt sustainability uh, challenges um, uh, that we face as all these countries try to divest away from fossil fuels. So we want to invite you to join uh, NRGI, IGF, and the uh, Tax Justice Network as the, we know there are many other organizations that are thinking about these issues, uh, you know, to think collectively as we pro uh, pro uh, provide some possible pathways for, for governments as they struggle uh, to deal with these issues. Thank you very much. And um, as we've been told already in the chat box, the recording and the materials will be shared. Um, and so you will have opportunity to to look through this and look forward to seeing you another time when the uh, NRGI, IGF and the Tag Justice Network invites you to this conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>